Hi everyone, my name is Shalini Upu. I am Director of Admission here at Reed College. I'm getting some, some folks joining us. This is our uh, faculty office hours on computer science. So you're in for a treat this, this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, we are absolutely thrilled that you all can join us. Uh, we are super excited to share with you a little bit more about our computer science department as well as Reed. Uh, and I have one housekeeping request before we get started, which is if you do have questions at any point during the session, go ahead and direct chat those privately to me. Uh, again, my name is Shalini. You can see me in the, the drop down chat menu there. This way, I'll just make sure that the right questions get to the right people to be answered. And if for whatever reason we don't get to everything, uh, someone on our team will, will for sure reach out to you and help you out there too. So, um, also, are there any admitted students in here? Anyone from our, uh, all right, awesome. Congratulations, a, a welcome to everyone and a very special congratulations to our admitted students. Uh, we know that, that May 1st is, is right around the corner for us and we are, we're really excited to, uh, in this last stretch, kind of be able to give you some additional academic information uh, to help you make your decisions. So without further ado, let me turn it over to the stars of the show here, Mark and Anna. Uh, please take it away and uh, tell us a little bit about computer science at Reed. Sure thing. Um, so my name's, I guess we'll start with introductions. Uh, I recognize some faces from last time at the math CS se session. So some of this information will be a uh, repeat, but we'll also be going over hopefully some new questions. Um, my name is Mark Hopkins. I am a professor of uh, computer science. I specialize in teaching the courses on introductory computer science and artificial intelligence. Uh, what I do with my research typically are applications of machine learning to natural language processing. So specifically like anything that you might want to do intelligently with language using a computer like automated translation, or automated question answering, that all kind of falls into my general research area. Great, um, and my name is Anna Ritz, um, and I am a professor in the biology department here at Reed. Uh, and you may ask, why is someone from the bio department in here talking about CS? And that's because I'm a computer scientist by training. And um, I focus on designing algorithms for analyzing large biological data sets. And um, I work really closely with a lot of the faculty in CS and math um, and actually have a lot of CS students in my lab doing research with me. So I guess what we'll do is we'll begin um, while questions are coming in. I mean, you should feel free to really start asking those questions because <laughs> be great if that would be like driven by what you're interested in. But I'll give a quick overview of our um, curriculum that you would expect to be taking at Reed. And so I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, let's see here. All right, and uh, so Anna, since you can talk, you can confirm whether or not you can see this. Yeah, I just muted myself, but yeah, that okay. looks great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is a kind of a depiction of our um, standard course sequence for majors in computer science at Reed. Uh, you'll notice that it actually, like, there's a lot of numbers here which uh, don't really tell you which discipline they're in. So the ones that are at the top, so calculus, analysis, and linear, which is linear algebra, those are all referring to courses from our math department, as well as 113 discrete structures. And so one thing that makes Reed uh, somewhat uh, different from other computer science uh, offerings, especially at liberal arts colleges, is just the emphasis on math. Computer science has been part of the math department for quite a long time and became a department of its own recently, um, only actually a couple of years ago, even though computer science has been a major at Reed for many, many years and has a long history. Um, but what that has allowed us to do is have a computer science uh, curriculum that is kind of halfway between the mathematical foundations and theoretical foundations of computer science and the kind of practical hands up, roll up your sleeves implementation side. So you'll see in addition to the math courses, uh, what we have is an intro sequence 121 to 221. That's just CS1 and CS2. Uh, CS1 is taught in Python. And then CS2 is predominantly taught in C++. 
And what those two courses do is they provide you with a rigorous sort of introduction to what computer science looks like at a college level. Um, from there, you have sort of two required paths that you have to go down. One is the theoretical path, which you see in the branch above, which goes to 3D2 and 387. 3D2 is the study of algorithms. Uh, so you learn to analyze how complex things are in a formal way. So for instance, you might, uh, you know, it might be unclear whether or not the optimal way to pack items into your the trunk of your car is easy or a hard problem. And so in that course, we proved that, you know, that's actually quite a difficult problem. And we proved that in a formal way. 3D7 is also formal, but is more into how, what computing actually means. And so coming up with formalisms that um, we can prove things about and prove things about when things are likely to terminate, et cetera. Uh, on the other side of the spectrum, we have 3D9, which is systems. That's much more of a, an engineering type of course where you're learning how to intelligently put pieces of a complex system together and make them work. And it's kind of driven by both principles and practice. So there are a lot of driving principles that will teach you in those courses in order to be able to design large systems like Zoom, for instance. And, uh, there's also the practical side of it because you know you'll have projects in that course that will really kind of force you to be able to implement things effectively. We also have a wide range of electives, uh, so you have to take at least four uh, electives as part of the major. And here are some examples. So, because of the fact that we are a liberal arts college, the electives will change from year to year depending on what uh, the faculty are teaching and. Uh, who's around, but specifically uh, some of the examples that come up a lot are networks. Uh, we have a cryptographer um, who teaches cryptography once every year or two years. Um, I do artificial intelligence and I also have an introduction to deep learning. Um, I'll be teaching an extension to that on natural language processing in the fall. Uh, Jim Fix, who's our chair, uh, focuses on things like programming languages and graphics. Um, and then there's uh, lots of other options as well. Um, and then uh, I'll let Anna talk about a little bit of the offerings of computer science that she offers in the biology department because she has a lot of uh, kind of cool computational bio uh, courses yeah. that are offered through bio. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Um, so uh, in addition to the kind of existing CS curriculum, there are kind of other, like, I would say almost like outcroppings of computer science that you may see across read um, in general. Um, we have, for example, um, a philosopher who uh, does a lot of programming and is looking um, at kind of trying to tackle philosophical questions like what is innovation by mining big data sets. Um, we have um, an art professor who uh, does graphic design. Um, and we also have uh, me in biology. And I kind of offer this bridge in order to um, have even more kind of applied opportunities to actually be able to implement a bunch of the algorithms that you, you know, learn about and formally prove things about in the CS course. Um, so I actually teach, I mean, my classes are all programming <laughs> focused classes and my intro class in biology is very, is kind of akin to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the intro CS course, um, just with a bio flavor. I also have an upper level class, uh, course that's essentially an applied graph algorithms class where you learn about a bunch of different graph algorithms and how they're used in biology um, and computational biology uh, specifically. Um, yeah, so basically those types of things uh, are also around. So there's also these kind of opportunities to, you know, apply the skills you learn in the CS major to the other classes uh, that you get to take at Reed. And so I'm happy to uh, continue by talking about uh, different topics. Are there any particular questions I should be answering, Shalini, at this point? We do have a couple of questions coming in, and thank you both. Good, good uh, overview of, of our departments here. Um, Leander is asking, actually, you, you may not be able to, to, to answer this exactly right now, but a question about the AP computer science test and whether it would cover often the material that you would you that you see taught in intro level computer science at Reed. Right. I believe um, the answer to that is that it usually does not 
cover the material that we would be covering in 121. And so there is this issue, like typically there have been students who have been able to pass out of the um, introduction to computer science, but the way the material that's covered at the high school level is typically not quite the same level of um, rigor that we kind of want to be getting students started on at the college level. And so you know, generally we prefer to have students start in 121 um, and really establish good foundations. Uh, one of the things that we've kind of been experimenting with or will be experimenting with next year is that we'll have two different versions of the intro course. One is for people who have uh, less experience and then one is for people who are coming in with more and who feel fairly comfortable with programming already. That course is uh, basically a replacement for 121. So you don't have to take 121 if you take it, it's called 122. Um, and it's half a unit instead of a full unit. So it's less of a time investment, but does make sure that you uh, um, kind of fill in all of the gaps that you might have um, from high school so that you, know, well, you can go into 221 feeling prepared for uh, that material. Yeah, and, and I would add that in general, you know, if you find that uh, you t start taking a CS course and it may be a little bit easier than you expected, um, that's actually a great opportunity to be able to explore some other class, you know, and maybe or maybe take a math course. Um, in a way, like having a, a class that is kind of more of a review is, is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, yeah, especially when you're starting out in college, I mean, I don't know about you, Anna, but like so far from my advisees, I kind of tell them that you should expect to take a unit in introduction to college life or something. So, you know, it's a good idea to not really load up too heavily your first semester because it's a, it's a big lifestyle adjustment and all sorts of exciting things are happening. And so, you know, taking three units your first semester is great because you kind of should expect that you kind of have this extra hidden unit on top of that, which is just kind of learning the ropes of like what college is like. And if on top of that, you have a course that you have some familiarity with, I think most students end up being somewhat grateful for the opportunity to kind of have an easier adjustment. We, we've also got two questions from Olivia and Yifang that came in almost at exactly the same time. So, uh, but basically both are asking, to the extent that you can study computer science and pair that with, a, with another major, or, or perhaps minor. Um, what, what kind of uh, workload would that look like and, and how possible is that? I'm gonna let Anna start with this one. <laughs> yeah, sure, cause like that's like the name of the game is interdisciplinary <laughs> stuff for me. Um, so first I'll say um, we, there are um, now minors at Reed in some, um, in some departments. Um, that's a relatively new thing. So if you're really interested in, for example, like a language minor, that's something that you can now do. Um, there is also kind of um, an, uh, a couple established interdisciplinary majors. Uh, however, for CS, if you're interested in um, combining CS with another discipline, any student is available, is, is able to petition for an ad hoc interdisciplinary major. And uh, this is actually relatively common. I've helped co-advise a number of them that are bio CS or bio math, um, interdisciplinary majors. Um, and you get, basically get to craft your own major uh, requirements kind of out of the two departments that you would otherwise double major in. Um, you, uh, the, one, the benefit to doing that is you get to do one senior thesis, which is at the end of your, you know, in your senior year, you do this one big project that's kind of like this culminating kind of uh, overview of what you have done at Reed. Um, and that thesis can then be a completely like interdisciplinary thesis. Um, you could, it is possible to double major, but that would mean doing two separate theses your senior year, one in computer science and one in whatever else you want to major in. So that is actually, there are people who do it, but there are very few people who do it because most people would want to actually in their senior year, combine their two interests. So, so that's definitely something that you petition for your sophomore year and kind of um, both departments sign off on it. And then you can be an ad hoc interdisciplinary, make up your own kind of major. Yeah, it should be said that these 
this is really not uncommon to have this kind of interdisciplinary major. Um, we have somebody who recently, or several people who've done bio CS. Um, I've seen plenty of physics CS as well. Um, then there are also these uh, kind of pre-designed uh, interdisciplinary majors that aren't ad hoc. So there's math CS is a formal version of this where the actual requirements are already spelled out for you. Um, actually, there's a slide for that too. So I'll, I'll just show you briefly what the math CS major would look like. And again, the advantage to doing these interdisciplinary majors versus a double major is you don't have to do two theses. Double majoring, I think, is more rare at Reed for that reason alone, um, but it gives you pretty much the same benefits without double the work if you do the interdisciplinary major. So here, if we go to, um, let's see, yeah. there. Uh, so the mathematics curriculum is there. Oh, I guess we don't have that. So imagine <laughs> the CS math curriculum. What's, what's gonna happen is that there's gonna be an extra course here. So you can kind of see the math curriculum by itself goes from linear algebra to vector calculus. Vector calculus is also a requirement in the math CS major, but that's really the only adjustment besides the, the electives. So you'll add that 202 to your curriculum and then the electives you'll have to split uh, between math and CS. And I believe it is uh, three of each that you need. You need three, uh, three level um, math and three three level CS. Um, and that's the only difference between those two things. So it's not a lot of extra coursework, um, but the main thing is that your thesis would be something that spans both math and computer science. And so part of the goal of doing these interdisciplinary um, majors is that you get to do a thesis which kind of crosses boundaries. Um, so either math CS or bio CS or um, I think dance econ was my favorite one that I've seen recently. We have somebody in studio art who is also thinking about doing a studio art computer science major because there's a lot of opportunities to use like computer science as a technology in kind of art projects. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's quite a common thing and, and you know, it's also a wonderful opportunity for us as faculty to get to know what each other are doing through our students. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, getting a question here from Mikhail about uh, what, how do employers and graduate schools view those, those ad hoc interdisciplinary majors? Um, and what, what do you actually see on the diploma? Does it say CS or some kind of hybrid of that? Um, okay, how about I'll answer it for the academic side and then I'll hand it over to Mark for uh, <laughs> employers industry. Um, so, um, your your degree does say a kind of a combined like interdisciplinary blah blah right kind of um it has both of those concepts um for graduate schools um read in general is uh you know kind of well known as uh sending a lot of really excellent students to graduate schools and um it in some sense you know the degree the the what you have as your major um is less important than perhaps the classes you took and the faculty that you worked with um, because in graduate school uh, they they require letters and so your faculty members so imagine your thesis advisor will be able to write really detailed information about all the stuff that you have done in a way that like other schools um, bigger institutions may not you, you may not have that connection um, so Reed is in general very high, high, highly regarded in graduate school and um, we kind of have, you know, we get to really know our um, students. I mean, every thesis, senior thesis is a single faculty, single student mentored experience. So it's essentially a class of one for the entire year. Um, so that's kind of in grad school where, uh, you know, uh, you'll really be able to kind of have your, um, yeah, have, kind of stand out, I would say. Yeah, in terms of um, the uh, way that employers view an interdisciplinary major versus a computer science major, I think that probably depends on the employer. Um, you know, the more, you know, if you are, you know, interested in doing something in, say, um, 
bio and medicine, then you know it can't hurt to have an interdisciplinary major. But I think uh, you know employers are going to be looking more at just the quality of your workload in general. They're probably not going to fixate too much on whether you have a computer science degree or a computer science dash something else degree. What a good reason for you to be doing it is so that you have kind of confidence and background in those materials, which will serve you later. Um, I think that ends up being sort of a more crucial aspect of doing an interdisciplinary major is if you have a particular passion for two different things and you want to explore their intersection, then explore that passion. Um, I would say it's less a it's less of a good reason that it would look good on a resume because people are really just going to like you can be a computer science person who didn't do a formal interdisciplinary major but took a lot of bio courses and that serves pretty much the same uh, function um, but if you have this passion and you really want to explore a, a like a year-long thesis project that spans bio and computer science then you absolutely should go ahead and indulge that passion because I think that's a unique opportunity that you have during your college career. I agree. Yeah, I, I should also point out that um, I really listened to Mark's advice because he came from industry before coming to read. So he actually has kind of a lot of uh, perspective on this. And sorry, that was my cat. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I like your cat. Um, so actually, maybe I'll, I'll spin off of that question a little bit then and invite either or, or both of you to talk a little bit about where do you typically see our majors and our students go on to after they graduate? Yeah, I have a slide I want to pull up for that. So I'll let Anna start so that I can find it. Um, so I, yeah, and I may have a little bit of a skewed perspective because all my students, um, at least my thesis students are all bio majors or interdisciplinary majors, um, but many of them do end up in grad school, um, not necessarily right away though. So there's a number of my students who go and get kind of, I call them post back experiences. So like kind of working in a lab or working at a larger institution for a year just to see what that environment is like before applying for graduate school. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think I, I do see a lot of students who do that. I also see a lot of students who go to those post back experiences and realize that they love working in the position they're working and they stay there. <laughs> so um, I, although many of my students do eventually make it to grad school. Yeah, yeah I think um, my impression is that Reed is, you know, a, it's known as kind of a, a good springboard for graduate school. But uh, that, you know, isn't, uh, if, if, let's, let's put it this way, the majority of students don't go to go, go, go get a PhD because the majority of people don't go and get a PhD. Um, and so, you know, what we try to do in the computer science department is prepare students for both of those tracks. So if you want to go and do research, then we will prepare you as well as we possibly can for graduate school. And if you're somebody who is interested in going into industry afterwards, then we're trying to prepare you as well as we can for that as well. Um, which is why we have, you know, kind of an even split between courses that are kind of theoretical and foundational, as well as courses that are um, designed to kind of get you to roll up your sleeves and be able to kind of build things. So um, one slide I did want to share here just because it's something that I don't know has impressed me about Reed uh, is its disproportionate um, uh, percentage of students that do end up getting PhDs in STEM and so here we have this kind of graph from a recent study uh, and I'm gonna let's just put this all the way up okay so just to, to walk you through what this graph is saying, um, the dots here, the x-axis is kind of the number of doctoral recipients in STEM from uh, 2007 to 2016 by college. And so that's the absolute number, but then the y-axis is per capita. So that means little percentage of students. So Berkeley, you can see has, it has an enormous amount of students anyway. So it sends a lot of people to grad school and it has the top number of uh, students who end up getting doctorates. But Reed is right on this kind of trajectory 
of um, sending a huge proportion of its students to get PhDs. Now, REITs is a much smaller college, so on the x-axis, it's much closer to the thing. But you can kind of see that it's it's operating at the same level as Caltech, MIT, UC Berkeley in terms of the number of students that it uh, successfully sends to uh, graduate school. And I think you know one of the reasons why I read is kind of exceptional in that regard is this uh, senior thesis. It's one of the things that's very unique about Reed. Um, and it gives students an opportunity, which I certainly didn't have as an undergrad, to um, at least partially answer the question for themselves about whether or not grad school would be a good fit for them. Because you spend a year doing research of the kind that you might be doing in grad school. So you get to sort of try before you buy. You go and you say, okay, well, I, I actually liked that a lot. Which is why, you know, a lot of read, read students do go back not immediately to grad school, but later because, you know, during their senior year, they realized, oh, actually, I really did enjoy that. And that's something that I might want to do for a living, um, which is an opportunity that, you know, most people have to go into blind. When I went to grad school, I was like, I don't know. I've never read a paper before. I didn't really know whether I would enjoy it or not. I just kind of thought, uh, well, you know, I don't want to work, so let's go to <laughs> You can certainly do it for all the wrong reasons, uh, but read allows you to kind of make an informed choice about whether or not research is something that is something that really drives you. And if it doesn't, that's even good too, because then you know it's not. You go to industry and you don't necessarily, you know, have to waste years on a master's degree or a PhD that doesn't uh, intrigue you. We, uh, we're getting a, a fun question from Matan about what is the typical read computer science student like? And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll expand that to include uh, sort of what are ways, some ways in which CS students build community among each other and, and maybe throughout the department? Yeah. Um, well, I, I don't know if I dare ask the, answer the question, what's the typical read computer science student like? I mean, I have thoroughly enjoyed my experience with the students here. I came, I started here only two years ago. Anna mentioned I came from industry. Um, for me, it was kind of an experiment because I was sort of impressed by Reed's, uh, Reed's curriculum. And so I thought, okay, let's give this a try. And you know, one of the reasons why I applied for a tenure track position here was because it was just such a pleasure interacting with the students. They're very, um, motivated, very studious, um, have like generally just great personalities are fun to be around. Um, also, you know, it's a, this, this senior thesis really does bring you really a lot closer to the students because you're working with them, you know, on a day-to-day, -day, week to week basis. And so, yeah, that would make my answer to the question. Like I've not been at other schools, um, so maybe, Actually, this is your first school to enter, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I think but, I think something that could be a good answer to that is like a concrete example. So, the CS department is relatively new, um, but Mark has actually helped kind of be the faculty mentor for the CS student social group that has been established kind of this year. And one of the things I w participated in was a trivia night that involved not only kind of like pop culture trivia but also trivia about like facts about the different faculty and there were all the faculty the com computational faculty were there um, as well as a bunch of students um, so it's kind of like I would kind of describe it as like yeah you can't really describe what a CS student at Reed is because they're all kind of different but um, it's it's a really kind of fantastic group and a really good kind of community and and you know it's really fun to be as a faculty member to be a part of a, a CS department that's forming and the student, the students basically get to start defining what the culture of that department is. And so we're kind of at that point and it's really cool to see. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like it's been fun to see this student group to come together this year and sort of try to figure out what they want themselves to be, you know? What do they want the culture of the computer science department at Reed to look like? And we're still in this kind of foundational phase, like Anna said, where, you know, students who are coming in right now have a lot of agency about how they want that culture to look like because it's a two-year-old department. 
So uh, you, you've both mentioned the, the senior thesis and, and the importance of that, um, and especially how it, it successfully helps successfully set up students for, for positive graduate school outcomes. So I'm, I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind sharing an example or two of, of a thesis you, you're maybe currently advising with a student or perhaps one you, you've done prior. Do you want to talk about Anantana, Anna? Well, the one that is at the forefront of my mind is a thesis that Mark and I happened to co-advise last year. <laughs> And we are currently working on a publication to get it out the door related to that student's work. Um, so this, so Ananthan um, what graduated last year and uh, is now in grad school. And he was a computer science major, but had done a lot of like, actually didn't take bio classes at Reed, but just had done a lot of bio related research um, in previous institutions. Uh, and so he kind of, basically brought Mark and I together in the same room and said, I want to develop a deep learning model um, related to um, kind of predicting uh, protein families. So the idea is that two proteins um, in the cell, if they have a similar <coughs> structure, they may be doing the same thing. Um, and so I want to be able to predict that. And I didn't know much about uh, deep learning approaches and Mark didn't know much about protein family <laughs> prediction. <laughs> And through Ananthan, we, we kind of came up with a really fantastic project that he is continuing to push forward. Um, and um, he was able to present his thesis work uh, at a conference last summer as a poster. Um, and uh, it was a really fun example of someone who was a computer science major. He actually wasn't even an interdisciplinary major, but he wanted to have some element of biology in his thesis. Um, so we were able to make that happen. Um, is that a... Yeah. yeah, you want to add anything else? Good answer. Yeah, no, I mean, so that's that's like, uh, Ananthan is like a great example. And it's also a great example of somebody who did an interdisciplinary thesis that wasn't interdisciplinary, like because it was a CS thesis, but it uh, had both me and Anna and it was very much in like, had its feet in both of those biology and computer science um, to get a sense of like what other people might be working on. Um, I have a student who's doing uh, basically length. Well, I, guess, I guess I had a student in the fall who just graduated who is doing um, automatic poetry generation uh, with RNNs. He was really fascinated by this idea of um, like there have been projects already using neural networks to do kind of generation of poetry but they are always like required to do a very kind of fixed meter. And so he was trying to kind of mathematically formalize what free verse means uh, from sort of an information theoretic perspective and ended up with a, a piece of code that could, um, you know, generate uh, its own meter that would be in some sense, uh, some formal sense, uh, uh, beautiful. <laughs> 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 yeah, the beauty metric. Um, so, you know, there's, it depends on what your passions are. I mean, a lot of times, you know, professors will have like projects that they are going to talk to you about that they are interested in having students work with them on for their thesis. But it also happens sometimes that students have particular ideas that they want to pursue. And um, sometimes, you know, that works out really well. Um. Mark, a uh, uh, question for you. Uh, wondering about if you wouldn't mind sharing with, with the group uh, your transition from industry into teaching and, and higher ed, kind of, you know, how how's a nice guy for, like you go from uh, from industry to teaching here at Reed College and uh, kind yeah. of what that's been like? Um, that's a weird story. I mean, it's <laughs> more like... Um, my project at uh, the previous place I was at, which was the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence in Seattle. Uh, so I was managing that project for several years and it was kind of coming to a close. We were wrapping it up and I needed to kind of determine what I wanted to do next, whether I wanted to move on to another project there, whether I wanted to go from that nonprofit research institute back to say industrial research, because um, I'd worked in a uh, machine translation startup for quite a few years as well. Um, and then for some reason I was reading uh, an article about uh, small liberal arts colleges and their approaches to computer science education. Um, for me, 
there was something that I really liked about the idea. Uh, I grew up in Canada, so I wasn't really familiar with what a liberal arts college was. And when I was making a decision about going into academia or going into industry, I chose industry principally because, um, you know, one of the attractive parts about uh, academia for me was the teaching component and at a lot of the bigger schools they're much more incentivized to uh, focus on research and so the teaching is um, you know it's great if you do it well but they don't really incentivize you to do that and that wasn't really attractive to me because I wanted if I was going to be at a college to be you know focusing you know 50 50 equally on both the quality of my teaching and the quality of my research. So when I was reading about these uh, these kinds of smaller colleges where they did have this nice balance between teaching and research, I was like, oh, I didn't know this was a thing. So I, um, since I was in Seattle, looked up uh, some examples and then Reed was Portland. Um, the article mentioned Reed because uh, Steve Jobs briefly went to Reed and so <laughs> It was a good, he's a good example of like computer science, uh, the value of a liberal arts education in computer science. And so I uh, applied for a visiting position and um, got it and then came down here and then just really enjoyed it. So I stayed on. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. We're glad you're here. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and so I think this is actually a good, a good ap appropriate last question here. Um, you know, our students are sort of choosing between studying computer science at perhaps a smaller liberal arts kind of setting, uh, as well as maybe medium-sized or, or larger schools uh, with, with, um, with different opportunities uh, at both. And so what, what in your estimation is the advantage to studying something like computer science or related fields uh, here in a, in a smaller liberal arts college? Uh, I would say um, that here are the pros and cons. Okay, so the pros are that you get to know your professors and you get, you know, one on one interaction with those professors. You get to do this senior thesis, which is something that is kind of rare to have undergraduates involved in uh, research experiences at larger universities. I mean, it does definitely happen, but it's um, not something that every student gets an opportunity to do. Um, the courses are very much tailored towards uh, educating the student. So uh, I went to Berkeley as an undergrad, and you know, even then, computer science lectures were, you know, a thousand people or something like that. And you, if you fall behind, you fall behind. Nobody's going to care if you fall behind. If you have questions, you know, you can go to office hours, but you just don't know the professors, so you feel very uncomfortable doing so. Um, and the professors, the quality of their teaching is uh, more scattered because of the fact that they are being hired because of their research acumen, not for any other reason. And so for me, I think those are the major advantages to coming to this place like Reed is that, you know, the teaching is going to be much better on average. Um, you get to do research. Um, you're kind of forced to do research, which is nice. Um, and I think the only downside I would say is the um, just that we have fewer people. So the variety in the course offerings is going to be less than in um, say one of the big schools. However, um, that has to be kind of balanced with the fact that you know we're still giving a comprehensive set of course offerings. So just because we don't have databases every year, that's okay. I mean, we have other courses which are just as good and you can't possibly go through all of those courses anyway. So, um, you know, I think it's a fair trade off for um, the variety of the courses offered uh, in to basically it's trading off variety for quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would echo everything Mark said. Um, I mean, I, I went to a liberal arts school for college and I think um, one of the differences that Reed offers is that the research experiences are kind of baked into the curriculum um, in, the, in a way that like your senior year, all of your senior friends are gonna be going through the same experience together. Um, whereas at my institution, I was able to kind of seek out some research opportunities and like I, am, I am imagine that you all could seek out opportunities at whatever institution you go to, but like at Reed, it's kind of, that that is like kind of 
um, given to all students as a default, which I really, really like. Um, I think also, you know, that also gives students flexibility to learn things that maybe aren't in the curriculum, but like with some um, faculty mentored guidance, you know, if senior year rolls around and there's one thing that you really want to learn and you haven't learned it yet, like you can construct your thesis around it and essentially take a one-on-one -on -one mentored two class, you know, like uh, research experience uh, to learn that concept. Um, so there's that flexibility in there as well. Um, yeah. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. And thank you all for, for joining us uh, this last hour. We, we really, you know, I hope we've answered as many questions as possible. If you do think of anything else later on, Mark, and I hope this is okay with you, um, please don't hesitate to, to reach out and uh, we'll make sure that we get your, your questions answered. I think we got, we got through everything in the chat, but, um, but if you think of something later, don't, don't hesitate. And for the admitted students in here, again, congratulations. Uh, gosh, of course, we wish we could be, you know, celebrating with you in person on campus right now, but, um, but really important for us to, to stay safe and, uh, and we'll make sure that, that you still get as much information, as much uh, kind of glimpse into what READ is like uh, to the extent that we can. So. Thank you all for joining us um, and stay in touch. But yeah, stay my, my email is hopkinsm at read.edu. If you want to ask any questions, I'm happy to answer those over email. And uh, you can also find that through the uh, Read Computer Science webpage. Yep, and you can find me through the bio webpage. It's aritz at read.edu. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Well, enjoy the rest of your day and have a wonderful week.